was four months old, my mother uh, drowned in Lake Charles, or or so I was told uh, by my father. Just like that, it happened within one second or two at the most. Felix, what happened to Mary? So here I am, life. October 28th, 1962, Felix Vail tells police his wife Mary drowned in the Calcasieu River. Was it an accident or something more sinister? And if it was murder, how would investigators prosecute a 50-year-old case? We grew up in a little town where dogs ran free, you could ride around town on your bicycle, everybody thought the best of each other. Yes ma'am and yes sir was everywhere. Uh, being polite and nice to people was the persona of where we lived. And Will Horton says his sister Mary was one of the nicest of all. She was just so kind and wonderful. I mean, she was a sister that every little boy would want to have as a big sister. It was the 1950s, a time when home video was more of a luxury than the norm. And while Will cherishes the scenes of happier times and family vacations, he says it's the simple things that he remembers most about Mary. I was a spoiled little brother. In particular, rainy days, couldn't go out and play. She'd get out the Hardy Boy books, the Hardy Boy mystery books, pop popcorn and read me books till I'd fall asleep. Christmas time, we had my mother saw to it that she learned how to play the piano. We had a piano in our home. She would play uh, Frosty the Snowman, Winter Wonderland, and it'd be like, come here, little brother. So I knew all the songs, because <laughs> I had to sing them when she played them, and you know, we'd sing them together. The all-American family, their father, a wholesale cotton buyer, their mother, an elementary school teacher. It's a staunch Catholic family kind of thing. Uh, we had an older brother. He was 14 years older than me. So by the time I was growing up, he was out of high school and in college. But that was okay, Will says, because he had Mary. I just loved her completely. She gave me the worst tickle attacks I ever had in my life. <laughs> she, was, she was something special to everyone. But the blessing was that I was family. But six hours and almost a whole other world away, Mary's future husband, Felix Bell, was being raised on a farm in Clay County, Mississippi. We went to school in the same school, but uh, he was in, uh, two or three years ahead of me. But I was real friends, good friends with his brother Ronnie, so I was around him a lot. And longtime family friend Wesley Turnage says Felix's actions were already raising concerns. A dairy farmer always had a lot of cats around because they had a lot of feed there and the rats would eat and no holes in the bags and get the feed out and eat up the feed and, and they kept cats around to keep the mice down. And the cats would have kittens and he would hang them up on the clothesline, throw rocks at them and kill them. He just was a psycho. What were his mom and dad like? You know, they were respected people. His mother was real sweet. They had a good life. He had uh, everything he needed. You know, he dressed good. He always had a vehicle to ride in and stuff. And that old skating rink just had a tin wall on it. And there's been a lot of us that fell and knocked that tin loose when we hit it. Do you know if Felix ever hung out with, with people like that over? Uh, he's kind of a loner, the best that I can remember about him. I don't remember ever seeing him with a group like we do, you know. A stark contrast to Eunice High School's popular homecoming queen. She loved what she achieved. 
but she shared everything that she had with her friends. Mary would continue to thrive as she left her home in Eunice to follow in her mother's footsteps as a teacher. I believe it is. Yeah. But there she is. Oh. Kathy Robbins and Judy Turney were in the same sorority as Mary and lived in the same dorm. I think it was sixty-two fifty a month back then. Oh my goodness, you remember that? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why. And Mary was right across the hall from mm -hmm. me. Right next to me. Right next door to Judy. Mm -hmm. We just got to be real close friends, you know. Getting up, going to class. Coming back, trying to find something to eat. And then gathering in each other's rooms, you know, and talking about the day and laughing and giggling, just typical who we were dating and that sort of thing. And they were about to hear a story about a new man that had caught Mary's eye, Felix Vale. To hear Felix's side of that story, we'd have to go behind the walls of the Angola State Penitentiary. never met my mental and electrical equal in a male or a female and here was this and her so we we recognized that on our first date about a year before we got married in a church we married ourselves uh, almost as soon as we met. When she let it be known to us that Felix was the one, I did, didn't go against that wish of hers, you know. If, if that was the one that she loved, then we loved him too. That's the way it went. Mary's sorority sisters also tried to be supportive as the relationship grew. For her, yeah. We weren't happy, mm -hmm. were we? <laughs> we didn't like Felix. Uh, I, and I can't be specific, I don't know exactly why. He was very deceitful, and he fooled her. And just a year into the marriage, Will says Mary figured it out. Well, she came home in early September of the year that she died. She died in October, and she had a closed-door session with my mama. And I believe that she said she was ready to leave him, and I think mom said, Go back and see what you can work out. And she was dead before she came back, before she had a chance to come back. Gosh, that's an awful lot for your mom to have to uh, carry. It crushed her. Day. It crushed her. Absolutely. Yeah. It crushed all of us. She was teaching, making money. I was working, making, you know, at that time, better than average money. And we had few debts. Our, apartment and uh, I think a car note maybe. And Mary had given birth to the couple's first child and Felix's namesake, William Felix Bell Jr. They called him Bill. What? I don't know. Just the only ideal time of my life. And I'm, what, 80 now almost. But Mary's friend saw a very different picture of the marriage. I could tell that there were certain things that were bothering her. But then when the baby was born, it seemed mm -hmm. like she was a lot happier. And Much happier. It looked as if the advice from Mary's mother to go back and work things out was paying off. That is, until the evening of October 28, 1962. I was off from the refinery and I had, had fishing lines, trot lines you call them. And so I was going out to take them up. She wanted to go with me. This was a pretty Saturday and, you know, she needed an outing. She was breastfeeding Bill and, you know, pretty confined there when she wasn't teaching to. So uh, we just uh, 
rowed across the lake. My boat was kept in a shed, boat shed. And we had to go all the way across the lake to get to the river under the big arch bridge there. And um, about a mile or so up the river was where I had the lines tied. So we just motored over there and I had uh, one gallon milk jugs turned upside down, tied to the line periodically as floats. And I didn't see any of them. So we went on up the river just sightseeing, past Westlake a ways and uh, came back. And, and didn't see any of them. So I turned the boat around and headed it back up river. And was going, we were going really slow, kind of like about a slow walk speed, looking for the floats. And she was in the front. I, I was sitting on a, the gas tank right by the motor, handling it by hand, manual, whatever and she was on the uh, driver's seat up in front of the boat. We, we were going north, I think north anyway. We were look, both looking east on the east side where the floats would be. And she said, she was on her, uh, sitting on her calves and, and like this on the driver's seat and she kind of raised up and pointed um, and said, there's one. And just like that, it happened within one second or two at the most. The front end of the boat where she was, there was a swirl of water about, oh, almost as big as this room. circular swirl that could only happen with the river current forcing its way around something under the water. Well, it threw the boat sideways. I don't know, two or three feet, I, I'm not sure, but just like that and toppled her in and I shut the motor off and ran up and jumped in right where she had fallen. But this circular, whatever you call it, uh, had a suction and it had taken her down. I, I went into the same spot that she went in and it started pulling me down. So I was pulling with it, trying to go faster to, to catch up and I never, I never caught. It had already taken her out of, uh, you know, deeper than I could go or deeper than I went. And when I ran out of air, I came up and went down and did that until I couldn't anymore. So that's it. She was gone and I knew the river had her and um, when I swam downstream to where my uh, boat had drifted to. I, I, that's the closest I've ever come. That's the closest I had come until at that time to dying because I w had used all of my energy and my adrenaline and everything was gone and I, I uh, only made it to the boat thinking about Bill being left with no parents. I came back across the lake and put the boat in the shed and got my car and went to the sheriff's office and filed an accident report and went to the babysitter and got Bill and just held him the rest of the night. Uh, excuse me. A lot of, a lot of looking at the questions that you asked me, and I had time to 
you know, relive them in my memory. And and breathe and stuff, and, and it's, uh, I'll, I'll be all right in a couple of seconds, but some of it is um, pretty dramatic to re-experience. And I have to do that to, to talk about it and be, you know, let my memory rerun its tape or whatever you call it. Mary's body would be recovered two days later in the murky waters of the Calcasieu River. Boy, when something that like that hits you, just everything goes black. You know, it's just just a devastating time for our family completely. Disbelief, yeah, just unbelievable. You know, we just, oh my, it was just so unheard of, especially in that day and time. Yes. And a troubling question lingered for Mary's friends. Had a premonition Mary had in college mirrored her tragic death? Or was it a sign Felix's story wasn't adding up? I remember it in the dorm, that she would die young and she would die by drowning. She was scared of the water. I thought it was most strange that she went out on the that boat. She went out on the boat. Even stranger, according to Judy, Felix's behavior as his young wife was being laid to rest. It was like it was no big deal. It was casual to him. You know, he wasn't affected like you would think a loving husband would be when his wife had just drowned. I never saw him break down and cry. I, he never came over to me and said, I, I'm so sorry. I, we shouldn't have been in the boat. Uh, I love you, sister, so much. Never, ever heard any type of response like that from him at all. It wasn't until later that we began to think about the circumstances and his demeanor throughout the whole process. So was it the demeanor of a guilty man or a husband facing accusations that were swirling now faster than his description of the Calcasieu River? This was something that was unusual for her to want to go out with you in the water, right? No, it was not. We, we, she went out with me in the boat all the time. When I first met her, she had apparently um, at a high school party on a lake, fall, uh, uh, part of the wharf had broken under her foot and she had fallen and uh, I think broke a leg. I'm not sure exactly. Hurt herself pretty bad. So uh, she didn't mess around with the water after that. But she got over it pretty quickly with me. And there's more. Like why had Felix purchased a life insurance policy not long before Mary's death? Mary and I were going back to Acapulco again for our second honeymoon. And we were going within a couple of months. We had Bill now. The travel agency told, told us to redo the insurance so that it would include him. Well, we had done this and had everything ready except the calendar for us to go to Mexico again. When the accident happened, this insurance man got a guy on one of the boats to say, when they found her body, that this looks like foul play to me. But that was enough to throw suspicion about the accidental of the, of the drowning. Being a member of the family, what would you get from that? They got that I somehow caused her death. Sometime after that, I, I was working at the refinery still, not knowing what to do next. And one day when I was clocking in at the clock house at work, here's a covey of law enforcement people to arrest me right in front of God and everybody and all of the other men that I worked with for a dramatic effect, which of course it had. So they take me in and play a good cop, bad cop game with me. 
we know you did it and, and, and stuff, you know, just what, 24 hours, no sleep, these guys coming at me. And finally, after whatever legal amount of time, they, they released me. From what my mom and dad said, I was too young to be a part of any decision making. But she said that the district attorney said that things looked a little bit suspicious. There just wasn't enough to go forward with. And that's how it ended for us. But it was far from over. In fact, no one realized just how far the end would really be. It was years later when they discussed the fact that he was in that ski boat. There's no way that you could run trout lines in that ski boat. It was a wooden rib boat. It sat high. And at the time, in the place that he claimed that she had fallen into the water, the river forked, and there was still a current going through there. But that side of where they relocated, where they located her body, was a commercial area. People didn't fish there. So there were a lot of things that didn't add up. Of course, there's rumors all over the refinery, and this this is what they wanted, you know, to create suspicion. So they did, and. That might have been a factor in me deciding to take Bill to Mississippi. The move came despite Mary's family wanting to stay close to the only part of her they had left, the child she loved so dearly. We thought he was going to be adopted, and come to find out, he never was adopted. My mother was spoiling Bill at about three or so. She was spoiling him. I was working and going to uh, college some, and... and um, he was getting spoiled, so I quit the job, got in my 57 Chevy convertible, and started making circles, bigger and bigger circles. One state, two states, what, looking for a place that, that I thought was a good place to raise my son. I didn't find any, and my brother was going through uh, the naval training at San Diego and I wound up there. Bill described his unusual journey in a church podcast. My only possessions, I guess, at, at that time were a sleeping bag and a pair of shorts. I had no, no shirt, no shoes, nothing else. And very little to eat. It consisted of whatever type of orchard we were living in at the time. Um, uh, cashews, if we were in a cashew orchard. Uh, grapes, if we were in a vineyard. But if there was one thing there was no shortage of, it was women in Felix's life. I've been in love so many times, I can't count them, hundreds of times. When Bill was small, I was looking for a replacement for her, for, me, for myself, but I was looking for a mother substitute for him. There, there was not anybody out of the hundreds of applicants we examined Nobody measured up to the benchmark that Mary had set. And one of those applicants, as he calls them, a free-spirited model named Sharon Hensley. How did you meet Sharon? Oh, I met her um, in San Francisco. That's when I found out the truth of, of my mother's death. And I overheard him just sobbing, which caught my attention. And he told her that he had murdered my mother. And, and I heard the, the girlfriend saying, oh, I know you must just feel responsible for it. That he, he said, no, you don't understand. I, I really did kill her. I just was in shock. That was too much for an eight-year-old. And I started walking right then. Um, walked two miles to the police station along the interstate and basically camped out on the front steps of the police station uh, and told them something like, uh, my father murdered my mother and he does drugs. And it uh, resulted in a multi-agency task force, um, uh, you know, county, federal agencies, uh, dozens and dozens of squad cars and police cars and vehicles of all kinds surrounded the vineyard and captured them, captured my, my father and his girlfriend and um, caught them with, with enough drugs to get them arrested and to corroborate my story at least that part of the story. Felix says the arrest was the result of an overzealous prosecutor with a personal agenda. 
he was going to take my son away from me, have him declared a ward of the court, and then he was going to adopt him from the court. Okay. Well, what about your son telling them that? Okay, they, they, during, during one of the times, they put words in his mouth. He didn't, I never told him anything like that, and he never said anything like that. Two detectives from Calcasieu Parish came there, and they were messing with him. They got one of the, uh, the, the psychiatrists, one of the four, they got him to hypnotize my son and put some uh, post-hypnotic suggestions. That probably was one of them. I don't know. M me and my son never had occasion to talk about it. Bill describes being the key witness against his own father when the case went to trial. That was terrible. That was traumatic beyond um, any description. And um, I, I believe the, the post-traumatic stress disorder um, symptoms, physical symptoms and such that I started having, I believe happened around then. I believed that my life was on the line because I truly believed that if he was acquitted and I was returned to my father, that he would kill me especially since part of Bill's testimony centered on the conversation he heard between his father and Sharon. And then, of course, the defense turned around what I said and, and of course, uh, basically said, you know, I'm only an eight-year-old. I didn't really hear what I thought I heard. The, the words I heard were, were ingrained in me, and I, I, knew, I knew what I heard. The young boy stuck in the middle of a battle no one could win his mother dead, his father now behind bars. I got returned to my grandparents and immediately went about trying to recapture the, the life I had lost. And unfortunately, that only lasted about two years. That's when Felix broke the conditions of his parole and headed back to the farm. And I came home from school one day um, and there's my, my father and his, the same girlfriend standing in the driveway. and. Um, I really thought that he was going to kill me. And, and I got off the bus and just remembered, you know, this deer in the headlights feeling, where do I run? But there was nowhere to go. Bill says Felix told him not to worry. He didn't blame him at all. Instead, he blamed Sharon. Later used that, I think, as an excuse to murder her. Uh, when I was about 13, he came back uh, without her in, you know, basically uh, he said she would never bother anyone ever again. And I knew what that meant. 